that you liked uh, this chapter. It was, uh, I the first time I read through it, I was looking to it, and I thought it was the most boring and awful chapter yet. Right. I was like, this, this, this is the first time in a while that I followed, I, I still listened to it, but I followed along with the actual book. Oh, good. Okay. And yeah, that had to help with, like, capital P and lowercase yeah, P. And right. You have to be, like, a savant to be able to understand without just seeing it. Yeah, I didn't fully understand it, for sure. Um, but even that, and then even the section on goodwill, I thought, was kind of enlightening. thought, like, the Monopoly set up, like, the reasons for goodwill. I guess we'll get to it. Yeah, let's do it. <clears throat> All right. So this is Human Action, Chapter 16, Parts 5 through 7. Mm -hmm. 5, 6, and 7. They are um, logical catalactics versus mathematical catalactics, monopoly prices, and goodwill. All in the context of a larger chapter about prices. And today is, what is it, May 24th, mm -hmm. 2019. Friday. It's, nice day out. It's a beautiful <laughs> Friday in Portsmouth. And uh, I'm trying to find the questions from our study guide by uh, 145. Robert Murphy. Okay. All right. So, five. Logical catalactics versus mathematical catalactics. What are the main currents of What are the main currents of thought in the field of mathematical economics? So, I believe there's three. And I know the first one's kind of a statistical approach and relies on this concept of a even uh, evenly rotating economy. Um, and then the first, the next two were kind of similar. It doesn't um, go into those in the summary by Robert Murphy. So there, there, there's a school of thought where it's all based on like mechanics and like physics, um, but maybe we'll look at another question. We'll talk about it, but it kind of explains why each of them are no good, and explaining economics because it, like, if you have a increase in the supply of something, then you have a decrease in the price, but it doesn't explain why someone would increase the supply. Right. And it doesn't necessarily follow. You don't know what mm -hmm. is going to happen or, you know, why, um, how much it's going to fall and like all of that mathematical analysis does not tell you what um, actually happens. Yeah. What's, yeah. yeah, what's going to happen. <clears throat> why does the statistical approach imply the presentation of historical facts? Why does this make it inappropriate for economics? So I guess the statistics are just, they are historical facts. They're data from what's already happened. Right. And why does this make it inappropriate for economics? Because it's not dealing with the current situation. And that's completely different. Yeah, I think it, the world is always changing and economics is about human actions actions that humans take it's not about the prices or this mm -hmm. or that like the supply or the demand it's about the actions that they take and until that happens you really don't know in what way can a datum of experience or statistical fact add to the understanding of the determination of prices. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you can know whether or not the prices are elastic or not 
depending on whether or not someone is still willing to purchase a good at a higher price mm -hmm. um, and see how high that, that price can go. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I think the key word is add to the understanding and it's not determine the price, it's just understanding it a little bit more. Right. Um, yeah, you can't predict for certain what is uh, what exchange will take place at a given price? Right. What do they say? History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, you could just meet a crazy yeah. person who's just right. like, "I'll pay a million dollars for that button on your jacket." Right. Um, or I I won't buy that water at any price, and I'll just die. Mm -hmm. um, what are the objectives of the investigations? of the relations of prices and costs applied by mathematical economists. What is the role of money within the analysis? So what are the objectives of the investigations of the relations of prices and costs applied by mathematical economists? That's a question. They I believe the, the question is getting to that mathematical economists are trying to come up with a, a, like a formula or mm -hmm. an equation where they can determine the outcome of, of what um, the results will be in a, in a given market. Right. But they, what is the role of money within the analysis? I think that they they forget the, um, what is the term, the money... Money's not an anchor to anything, because money's constantly changing. The money good, or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... They, they assume that money is kind of fixed. Right. And we learn that it's not. So, yeah. So that's, and that's the only reason uh, why all these equations can work, the supply and demand curve, or some of these different thing concepts, the only work piece they assume like money's fixed. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Maybe not. Um, okay, that makes sense. What are the objectives of the investigations or the relations? They're trying to um, explain with equations what the relations between prices and costs are. Um, but they, they fall short because money is itself a good a, a factor of production, so to speak, that's always changing. Mm -hmm. Why are calculations on the basis of units of utility nonsensical? Basis of units of utility. So I, I think it'd be utility to what? Um, you know, something's something useful for somebody might not be useful for others. Yeah, I would say so. And also, it has to take into account, like, so this gets a little complicated with the capital P and the lowercase p mm -hmm. stuff. But if if I value uh, one piece of pizza at the the number one spot in yeah. cardinally and then two pieces of pizza at the number two spot, but then at three I'm getting like diminishing returns of my units of utility. Yeah. And I, I start to value, you know, the keys to a new car at, mm -hmm. at greater than the third slice of pizza. It's <laughs> like, you can't, uh, you, you can't just use the basis of units of utility right. um, for calculations because they're, each one is changing at each different level, I would think. I don't... That sounds right. So what are two fundamental principles of the theory of value? Seems like it has a straightforward answer, right. but I don't know it. So I'm looking in the book for it. Two fundamental principles of the theory of value. Let's see. Um, that the, 
the I would I, I'm just taking guesses here from what I know that the consumer who engages in a in a trade with a producer values the item greater than that which he's trading. But we've already talked about that. But that's a fundamental principle of mm -hmm. the theory of value, I would think. I don't know that all value is subjective. What are, what are they, what do you think they are? You looking in the book? Yeah, I, I didn't. Not in the study guide. It's oh, of course. Um, fundamental. I think um, just yeah, subjectivity is definitely one, and then it's just the human element more so too. Um, I think because this chapter is talking a lot about you know perfect mathematical equations with quote equilibriums that don't really exist, and the root of that is because everything's subjective. And there's like a human element to everything. Yeah, so perhaps we can say that another fundamental principle of the theory of value is that we don't know what a, what um, somebody values something for until after a trade has happened. Right, through their actions. Yeah, we cannot, we cannot predict with 100% accuracy what someone values something at mm -hmm. until the action is taken. Okay, part six. Monopoly prices. What are the special conditions required for the emergence of monopoly prices? Give a short overview. So this is kind of interesting. So one, and it doesn't necessarily mean there's monopoly prices, is you have to have a monopoly. Right. Um, and then two, oh man, I made a note of this in my head. I think I know. Okay. I think you have to have an inelastic price curve, meaning that someone who, um, is, say the price of cigarettes increases three or four fold, people are still going to buy those cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, at any price, it doesn't matter. Right. So not only do you have to have the existence of a monopoly, but you also have to have consumers willing to pay monopoly prices. Right. Because, for example, if a bookseller has a monopoly on a particular book's text in the form of a copyright, he may have no willing consumers to buy that book because it's awful, and therefore he has no monopoly uh, prices, right? Is that what was the, the question was about what are this uh, yeah for the emergence of monopoly prices what are the sp special conditions required a monopoly and consumers willing to pay them mm -hmm. why isn't a monopoly the only prerequisite for the emergence of monopoly prices I mean I think it's kind of hit it on the head yeah, what you said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that it, it takes two in any given transaction, mm -hmm. uh, a, a monopoly existing on its own. Right, yeah, you can have a worthless good and you can be the only one in the world with it. But that doesn't mean you're going to be able to charge monopoly prices. Right, right. Why is it fallacious? To assume a third category of prices, what are the roots of this problem? Hmm. Why is it fallacious to assume a third category of prices? So the first and second would be market prices and then monopoly prices? Presume so. Okay. So... I guess the question is asking, why are those the only two possibilities? I suppose because one describes a situation in which there's free trade and another in which there is not. 
Right. And there's really no in between. It's like binary. Yeah. Well, there's a little in between between like different kinds of monopolies, hmm. I'd say. But yeah, there's like freedom or just not. What would be those differences? Like, um, so they talked about the difference between like um, cartels pricing versus uh, duopolies and oligopolies, hmm. and how they act a little bit differently. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean? So a cartel would be something where um, all of the gas stations come together in a city and create one enterprise. And they say this is the price of gas. Right. And then an oligopoly would be all of, like, there's few gas sellers in an area, and it's a little bit of a game. They, they, everyone kind of acts independently, but they still are able to charge monopoly prices because they're all watching the actions of the other players in the game. And the goal is to, well, there's a cap on how much like you can sell because they're holding back some of the supply. But the goal is to get your opponent to sell as less as possible mm -hmm. and for you to sell more, but with still having a cap. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, I still say I don't know the, the mm -hmm. full answer to this question. Right. Third category of prices, what are the roots of this problem? I don't know. I don't know what he's getting at. According to Mises, how is the control of supply misinterpreted? Hmm. Not sure what Mises kind of says on this. If I can think about it. The control of supply, I would think that um, an economist may falsely believe that an entrepreneur will produce s supply sufficient to meet demand in all cases. However, this may be a misinterpretation because an entrepreneur may restrict his own supply in order to produce a higher outcome, like a higher uh, profit for himself if a smaller number of consumers are willing to pay um, a higher price. I mean, I suppose that does meet demand then. That's, they demand it at that price. So I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I, how is the control of supply misinterpreted? I don't know. That that just it might be. I'm not sure how it's interpreted, so I'm yeah. having a hard time answering this question. Yeah. Why does entrepreneurial profit have nothing to do with monopoly? Ah, I know this. So, entrepreneurial profit is. Uh, It's when you're meeting the consumer's wants and you're getting all that profit. And then there's, it's not profit, but monopoly prices don't give you more profit. It gives you, I don't know what you're gonna call that, but it was that P plus T kind of thing. So P would be that profit plus this extra sum that you get from your monopoly price prices, but that's not technically entrepreneurial profit. Uh, what what is it? I don't know what it's actually called. Like you're still, they're making money. Like they're making more money, but it's not entrepreneurial profit. Why not? Because it's gain. It's not gained through meeting the consumer's um, natural demand or. Right. It's not, yeah, gain through catalactics or that. 
it's a violation of the um, consumer's supremacy, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I, I like I loved that uh, expression. Uh, Minxie's used it a few times in this chapter that the the consumer in a market is supreme, and with the existence of a monopoly, it's a violation of the supremacy of the consumer. Mm-hmm. I loved that. What is a cartel? Is it harmful to an economy? Well, you answered what is a, cart- a cartel? It's a group of businesses acting in concert with each other to maintain high prices and low supply. Right. Well, it's, actually, it's one organization in particular. Oh. So it's the gas stations coming together to form like the gas cartel. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. And is it harmful? It's not necessarily. Monopoly prices are harmful. Mm. Cartel has the monopoly, but it doesn't necessarily have monopoly prices. Okay. Is the number of competitors important for competition? Yeah, I'd say absolutely. Yes, there must be more than one <laughs> in order for there to be a competition. In that sense, the number right. of competitors is important. And, and then I'd say like two to ten, you can work together. But if there's 150 competitors, it's impossible for you to work together. That makes sense. Yeah, it seems to be that the more competitors, the more competition, mm-hmm. just as a matter of fact. What are optimum monopoly prices? Sounds paradoxical. Um, If I had to guess, and I do because I don't know the answer for sure, optimum monopoly prices would be prices that are the the highest price a monopolist can charge to guarantee the highest amount of profit for the lowest amount of inputs. Right. So to say if I can charge $11.11 for that pack of cigarettes and 100% of people will still buy them but then if I charge hundred uh, or $11.12 then only 90% of people will buy them then no. Um, uh, the optimum monopoly price is 11.11. Right from the the monopolist point of view would be to maximize profit so yeah what is meant by an incomplete monopoly what are the consequences Hmm. so I think you would see this in maybe it's not the great example but maybe Google which mm-hmm. would be an incomplete monopoly, whereas they have the lion's share of you know digital advertising, but there's still room for a competitor to come in. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, another example I think that Mises gave is that of a pharmaceutical company that produces something with a brand, and you're like, I'm willing to pay more for the one that says Tylenol even though I know all these others are exactly the same chemical Mm -hmm. because this one's Tylenol. (laughs) So uh, I would say it's not a monopoly. Perhaps it's an incomplete monopoly. And the consequence is that consumers are willing to pay higher prices um, despite the lack of an actual monopoly. In what way is free entry into the branch of production decisive for the preservation of cartels. What way? In what way is free entry into the branch of production decisive for the preservation of cartels? So I'd say if there's free entry into production then it doesn't bode well for cartels. No, it seems not. It seems like cartels got to keep yeah, if you have like a drug cocktail and but anyone can make cocaine, then it's going to be kind of hard to keep that cartel going. 
Yeah, or if, for example, you provide electrical services and anyone can just provide them, mm -hmm. then you have a problem because you want to keep your prices high. So you might invent a license <laughs> to prevent new entrants to the market to undercut your services. Yeah. Um, what is the importance of this fact for analysis of monopolies? The, um, what is the importance of this fact for analysis of monopolies? So I guess barriers, the barrier to entry is one of the most important factors into a monopoly. Mm. There mm -hmm. needs to be high barriers to enter for a, a monopoly to exist. That seems reasonable, yeah. And perhaps uh, it's also worth considering how high is the barrier to entry, like what is that factor of production, so mm. to speak, of buying the license to, to enter the market. What is the role of licenses with regard to the formation of monopoly prices? Well, licenses create, can help to create monopolies. Right, it raises the barrier. Right. As given in the electricity, uh, electrician example. What is meant by a failure monopoly? Failure monopoly. I remember reading this, but I don't know. I remember this too, because it's a funny name, but I don't, I don't recall what a failure, maybe it's in the study well, guide? This isn't from a book, but I'd just say, so, I'd say uh, New York City yellow cabs and medall medallions were mm. a failure monopoly. Why? Um, when Uber came into the market, and so uh. the the price of medallions um, in like 2010 were going up to like 160k, 200k, because there's only a finite amount of yellow cab medallions in New York City. Uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. It sounds like there's a parade. Yeah. It's interesting. I was not expecting a parade today. Is there? Oh, it must be for Memorial Day. Oh. Uh, All right. Great. Good for them. Drums. Um. Yeah. So the men, like the price of medallion went up like 200, 300k in like the late 2010s because there's only, I think there's only 60,000 medallions or something for the city. But then Uber came um, into play. And so a lot of people bought in like mortgage houses to buy these medallions um, because they thought they were being protected by this monopoly. And then um, Uber kind of ruined that with distributing like the rides. Ha, and the ha, ha. price of medallions crashed. Oh, the supremacy of the, the <sighs> consumer. That seems a reasonable answer to the mm -hmm. question. Why do labor unions not aim at monopoly prices? Hmm. I'd say a labor union's job is to protect its members by not letting anyone join the labor force at the same time raise their labor wages. Can you say that again? So the point of a labor union would be to protect its members and so the two ways it can do this is by not letting anyone join the workforce like monopolizing who can participate and then subsequently trying to raise, raise their wages. That seems union. right. So what, why do labor unions not aim at monopoly prices? I would think because it's in their self-preservation best interest, presuming that people can join the labor force without the union. Um, they want people to be in the union, so they have to make sure that um, 
people what? actually want to join. Wouldn't their labor hmm. be a monopoly price in itself? Like, seems like, like a it. teacher's getting paid a monopoly price on teaching because they're in a union. Right. So I don't fully understand this question. Like, I, I isn't labor is a, like wage is a price, and people in labor unions wages are artificially inflated. Well, why would a union, why would a group of people or, or a cartel not aim at the monopoly price? Hmm. I, I would presume because they fear competition. This question seems to imply there are labor unions and there are labor non-unions. And if the labor union aims at monopoly prices, no one will join it. Because it, it won't have any support. Hmm. It has to get cl close. But not... I don't know. Gosh, I, there's too many... My reading comprehension on this chapter is yeah. an F. I will do better next time. What, uh, let's see, what can mathematics teach us about the demand curve of monopolies? What can mathematics teach us about the demand curve of monopolies? Uh, I would say that it's, that it's inelastic. That no matter how high the demand or low the demand goes, people are willing to pay the same price for a thing. Or rather, the the demand is um, I forget how you would draw that on a graph. So I kind of start up here, like low price, very high demand, and it starts sloping downward as the price gets higher. Well, that wouldn't that be a a normal demand curve would be uh, going. Would I guess going down right as the supply, supply increases. Supplies on the horizontal axis. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> shoot. Goodwill. We covered monopolies pretty good. I think we get the rough understanding. I get an F in monopolies. I'm giving <laughs> myself a, a straight F on this chapter um, section, but sometimes I'm, I have really good comprehension, sometimes not. Goodwill. Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of goodwill? What are some of Mises' examples? So I kind of really like this section because, so goodwill is kind of, you know, the interaction with the consumer and, you know, if you have enough goodwill, then you can charge monopoly prices just because people trust you. And I kind of thought a lot about uh, the Bitcoin shop because if we develop enough goodwill um, then we're able to charge more of a premium for Bitcoin because people trust us and know that like we've been here for a while. We just they talk about establishing a reputation and yeah. So I think that's a, a big plus is goodwill. It was that way with the hardware wallets. We could charge double or triple the sticker price on a hardware wallet that people could get on Amazon yeah. because they are like, I know this comes from a reputable source and I, I'm going to get some help on how to use it and this place being here gives me value in this, you know, so in other ways. Yeah, I think the, the goodwill can command higher prices. Right. That's kind of what I got out of goodwill. That seems reasonable. Are there other examples? I would say like a high-end grocery store that is like, or, or one of the um, businesses around town that supports the theater 
-hmm. Like we're always donating to the cleanup effort and we're always donating to the city this and that and people will opt for maybe a higher priced cup of coffee from their business rather than some other one because they're like, you're involved in the community, there's goodwill here. Mm -hmm. We're voting for more of that with our dollar. Right. Still shows the supremacy of the consumer. Right, I think it's the goodwill leads to, I guess, the, the fair monopolies. Right. Pers like, they're, the consumers are giving you this monopoly because I guess you've earned it and it's not through any force, any through any license, it's like it's through trust. And yeah, they like it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you, like I felt like it was such a really long chapter talking about all these monopolies and how they're so bad and then you're like, so wait. Like natural monopolies kind of just emerge because of this goodwill. Yeah. Well, that's good. Right. How shall we conclude this? Um, what are some of Mises' examples? I don't remember a specific example. As a particular producer gains trust over time, this goodwill gives him an advantage over competitors who lack it. Many paternalist reformers wish to substitute government certification for the market's response to asymmetric information. But if the government appointees are themselves fallible or corrupt, this is no solution. Though inefficient when compared to a world where people are omniscient, the market outcome of brand name recognition and trust overcomes the problem of asymmetric information. Right. And they, I remember a certain point of saying, um, like, it, a consumer isn't omniscient, omniscient. Was that word? Omniscient? Omniscient, yeah. And, you know, when you're going to buy tissues, you you can't know like what's the best material for a tissue or something like that like you got to trust like these name brands that they're giving you the best of their industry or at least what you're paying for that makes sense yeah i don't look at the ingredients Right, and you just kind of trust that hey, it like, seems like a reputable brand, they, they know what they're doing. Yeah, Puffs says it's made with aloe, yeah. all right, we're good. Yeah, and like, how, have you done the research into like, is aloe the best thing to have in a tissue? No. Yeah, so you kind of have to trust that. Hmm, okay, good example. Yeah, Puffs has built up goodwill with me, they get a monopoly. <laughs> in my tissue consumption. All right, this was great. I learned that I must go through uh, reading comprehension a little better. I think your method of going through the book as well as the listening mm -hmm. um, is something I have to pick up on. I thought I misplaced my human action book mm -hmm. and would find it amidst all the moving, but yeah. I must have sold it. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had like 10 or 20 copies, you know, that we've sold from the Bitcoin shop. So Oh, really? F human action? Yeah. Oh, no way. Oh, yeah. Um that was a popular item. But um I must have sold my own copy. Hmm. So I'll get another. Yeah. Um
Definitely for this next one. We should just finish off chapter 16. Yeah, I think so. That's um, parts 8, Monopoly of Demand, through 15, The Chimera of Non-Market Prices.